talk to the staff, and we're just kind of waiting and seeing what's going to happen. You know, there's a lot of things that could happen too with the current staff, not just new revenue, but there could be retirements. There could be other people finding jobs elsewhere. There's a lot of things that can happen from now until, until May. Mr. Chairman, um, I like your suggestion, uh, Todd, about having a stakeholder group take a look at that. I, I really think that would be excellent. We did that uh, when we had some discussions about the possible discontinuation of program. Mm -hmm. I think we need to go back to another stakeholder group and say, develop some what is. Okay. Um, as a board member, I would like to see um, some what ifs relating to if the legislature increases foundation aid by $10 a pupil unit, what does that mean financially for the district? If they do a $20 per pupil unit, um, what does that mean for the district from a, from a budgetary standpoint? Um, and then of course, um, the never ending saga, what if it doesn't do anything? What if it stays the way it is? So I'd like to see a few more figures before I can talk about what are the priorities. Okay. I, I have a sense of what my priorities are, but it would help me sort that out uh, by having more uh, economic information available. Okay. At least that's my suggestion. I'm about to ask for the board. That's Mr. Kasky, yeah. Well, I'd like to bring in a, <clears throat> to me, a related issue, in that we revised our vision of student achievement. <coughs> and have yet to be given um, a lot of specific information in terms of how the broader or the, the now more broad definitions of student achievement that we're looking at are being met and addressed in our district. And with the fact that um, should any of the cuts current or the, the 1.6 million cuts be made, in addition to cuts made in previous years that have had an impact on our ability to deliver quality education to our students. Um, I'd like, it is my hope that the curriculum committee can be addressing uh, and looking at the impact of those cuts. And when we come to the point where we hopefully will be able to add back something, say very hopefully, an optimist at heart, um, we're doing so in light of that expanded vision of student achievement. Um, the, all the programs we have currently were, are valuable. There, there's no, I have no question about any of them. I, I regret to the utmost the cutting of any of them, but my, my point is that other cuts have been made in the past and we need to add back in such a way as that we support, to me, the primary vision of student achievement to the utmost degree possible. And so without some understanding of the impact of the cuts, per current, pending, and past, uh, how can we make a good decision about what to try and bring back should we be able to do so? So maybe I'm not getting at this very directly. I'm just trying to say that uh, whatever recommendations might be forthcoming at some point, I hope are made in light of um, our attempting to um, address student achievement in all its aspects. And I would say that anything that we do moving forward from an administrative perspective, from all staff perspective, is doing that. But, and what I guess what I'm looking for is some specific discussion, um, taking a look at what we're doing. Um, it's it's my opinion that over the number of years we've we've taken steps to improve test scores. Okay, that was the law, but now our programs that were intended primarily to pr improve test scores also the way best way to support our broader definition of of student achievement in all its aspects. That's part of the discussion I'm hoping that the curriculum committee can have in coming months. And just for process, Tom, just to get specific, are you okay doing, working with the stakeholder group first or the curriculum committee second or how, what's your envision of how that process, <coughs> I don't want to step on the curriculum well, committee or the finance committee. I context. don't want to, st I guess I hadn't thought about that. It, it, that's what I've been trying to state here has been my vision of what the curriculum committee should have been doing all year. 
and we've had several meetings. Our, our December meeting was canceled due to changes in and so on. So uh, I, I don't know that we can, they may all have to be simultaneous given the fact that we need to have some decisions made within four or five months. So I, I, again, I'm not interested in stepping on anyone's toes, but I think from a curricular standpoint that analysis hasn't been available to me as a school board member in the past, and that's something I'm looking for the curriculum committee to do. Well, and I think the part of the part, maybe part of the miscommunication is that we don't really know what you want yet. So maybe being a little more specific on what you're asking for, then we can come up with uh, an item that you're looking at. I know you don't want test scores, but is there something specific that you would like us to present to the curriculum committee that would answer your question that we are? doing okay. more than just teaching uh, to the test. Would you like a couple right now? Well, I don't know you need to <laughs> But I think that my point is we need, and it's kind of the conversation I had when you guys were doing my evaluation system, when you, when we are asking for something, I think it, it's a lot um, better for me to communicate with my staff what the specific piece is that you're asking for. I can tell you that we're offering a very well-rounded education for all kids, and it's not all about test scores, but I haven't convinced you that yet. So I need to know what's going to convince you that we are doing that. And if you have some specific suggestions, I think we talked about that the other day too. Mm -hmm. um, I just need to have some of that information for us. Not, not to get off track, um, I think uh, I resonate with, with uh, Tom's uh, suggestion that the curriculum committee have some involvement here. Um, I think as I would envision a curriculum committee, it should uh, uh, think about uh, uh, have some input on the best ways for us to, to allocate resources um, uh, once once it's been decided what those resources can be and I think we're at a point where we sort of uh, the decisions of what those resources are going to be have, have mostly been made um, so I would advocate for the curriculum committee to be um, strongly involved on, uh, uh, and so that brings me to the question of, of uh, the stakeholder group um, because I, I do think an additional stakeholder group has a, a great deal of value um, as well. Um, could you remind me, Todd, um, uh, who was involved at the stakeholder group um, when we were making decisions at the, the beginning of the year? I'll try. I don't remember the individual. I think there's a dozen people that were in that group, involved in that group, between administration, staff. Maybe not by name, but you know, by, yeah. by type of, of position. Um, yep. And I'm assuming we had principals involved. Yep, and staff, and, and then also community district groups. office staff. Yep. I'm sure. Yeah, there's a pretty good variety of uh, membership. I thought within the school group, we we didn't have as many community members as I thought we could have had. But I think as far as the school group goes, it was a pretty good um, piece. You know, the stakeholder group could be the curriculum committee because we we have that we have. Um, board representation, we have administrative representation, representation, we do have community representation too. You could, uh, we could set up more than one curriculum committee per month to review some of these uh, issues to have that communication and you don't have to have a separate stakeholder group either. Well, could you take the specific cuts themselves and organize meetings around that? I mean, and some of them may be curriculum meetings, but some of them may be more open meetings so people from the community, I mean, I know there's been some creative ideas presented to address some of the cuts. Mm -hmm. And so I would hate to try to hate to limit stakeholder involvement also. I don't know if that would make any sense or to go through the cuts systematically at a meeting associated with a specific cut that board members and community members could attend and give people mm -hmm. opportunities. That's, that's a good idea too, is you can group the different, some of the maybe non-so curricular areas that you're thinking of could be separate from the discussion and handle at a different right. venue. And it might be an opportunity for people to, in the community too, to learn about what what staff went through to make that recommendation that it wasn't done on a whim or it might, and maybe they could present at some point their ideas on why those cuts were presented. Eventually you're going to have to try to figure out which one's priorities because <laughs> right. in each of those well, subgroups are going to be priorities. I want to be careful not to um, <coughs> not to convolve two very important things, one of which is community comment and one of which is a working group. Um, uh, it's, it's hard, you know, a working group has to do some work with some things and, and that needs to be done with, that, that needs to work with a, a, um, 
a smaller group of people, um, all who are you know stakeholders as well, um, and uh, um, doesn't lend itself as well to the open forum, which we also need to have, but is a is a different thing. Um, How about just a, here's a suggestion: What if we have uh, develop get a board approved ad hoc committee together, and then each month they would they go through the curriculum committee with their suggestions and their discussion items. Um, we'd have somebody on the curriculum committee in that ad hoc to help communicate that piece too. And then the curriculum committee could make and help make some of those decisions at that level. And, and that would give us, we could maybe fit one in in January, but it gives us really January, February, March, yeah. and even April probably four, eight good meetings to talk about that. I was leaning towards sort of an overlapping mm -hmm. um, members between the two committees. Um, but I was going to suggest at least two overlapping members, um, mm -hmm. and perhaps one of them could be Tom or I, but probably shouldn't be both Tom or I, right. um, uh, so that it can be somebody else as well, uh, who's not a, a board member. Um, so, uh, um, I think that's a good idea. And then ad hoc committee, again, 12 to 15 people on the ad hoc committee um, to begin with including the two people who overlap into the curriculum area. Makes sense? I think it's a good place to start. Any okay. Questions or comments on that? Yep. What is the idea that they would come with a priority list for us, the board? I think eventually that through the committee, uh, the curriculum committee, they'll look at the discussion, the way I envision it anyways right now, is that ad hoc committee will meet with this focus group, they'll have the discussion, We'll talk about, for example, the handout that you received today with regard to the orchestra program, the music program, and how it's been cut over and over again over the years. Um, also yep, in the native program, and then also the elementary class size. All those different things will be discussed, and through that discussion, the first time through, the ad hoc committee may come up with a list of priorities. And then the curriculum committee will review that to see how that falls within their view of the curriculum and then they go back to the drawing board for the next month with March with the curriculum committees and then just keep on feeding back and forth until it filters out to something that they both can agree on. And then I think you bring it to the school board probably in April for a first review and then uh, May for the final review if there's a added funds that are coming. Is that kind of I think, well, and again, this is just my opinion, I think you would still allow people to have public comment with regard to any one of those. And if, if you want to put those items on the agenda in January, set items one through four on the agenda in February, items five through eight or whatever, and then give a chance for the community to come up and, and speak to the board at it, I, I think that's a good option too. I don't know if you want to put everything on the agenda in January, it's going to be a lot of folks coming in here and talking yeah. to you. When is this group supposed to start? I haven't decided. When would you like us to start? <laughs> well, if the if the state's not going to give us any money, then you're wasting your time. Well, I think the the time that's valued is the um, not only the relationship building, but also the determination that let's just say April, the curriculum committee gets the final priority list that they're comfortable with to recommend the board and the board's comfortable with the priority list and we end up finding out in May last minute that the state gives us hundred dollars per student it's under four hundred thousand dollars and then the way I envision it then is in May you would start with that priority one two three four until you hit four thousand four hundred thousand dollars and you're done So that's the, I guess that's the value of doing it early, so you have something to prepare for May. The timeline will be such that I think when we do learn whether or not we get money, we'll have to act very quickly. Right. And quickly and thoughtfully don't always go hand in hand, so I'd rather do some thought now, and if it ends up being a waste of time, I can live with that. But I'd rather live with wasting some time trying to be thoughtful. Than yep. And, and you know, things can change. I, my philosophy, as people have talked about uh, grants and um, one-time revenues and things like that is, is I think it has to be something that's long-term for the district. I don't want to go through this 
cut off, cutting process again with 26 staff members, like we just did for two solid days of 16 hour days, it was pretty brutal for not just the administration, but also the staff too. So I'd prefer to have a solution that's not kicking the can down the road. It's a long-term solution and it's sustainable. I want something sustainable for this school district. And if I could just piggyback on that for a moment, that's part of my thought behind taking a curricular look at this because whatever curriculum we establish, I, I want to be sustainable or sustained um, at the highest level that we can manage. So if you're comfortable with that process, we can go ahead and give it a shot. And then next month you don't like it, we can do something else. So how would community members be? They would be informed of the development that community yeah. committee and be invited to participate? Sure, and I can put that in the newspaper. We can, if you have some suggestions, just email me and I can go ahead and put those people on there. It's, it's a public meeting too. We don't want to get too many people inside the meeting. I think that you, you have the people that are between 12 and 15 that are the the people that are talking about the discussions, but everybody's going to be invited. But if you have suggestions on who can be on that committee, let me know. Do you, do you envision a lot of infighting? You know, if it's the music people or, or automotive people, it just, you know, put us up towards number one. I mean, what do you think? What's well, your opinion? I think that's where the curriculum committee really comes into play. I really do. I think that's where Tom's group will look at it, and if it happens to get down to that controversy whether we want to add back orchestra or uh, fourth grade teachers um, then I would support the curriculum committee's decision on that but you're right there's probably going to be conflict I'm not going to be um, that's going to happen um, so <coughs> I, I think uh, um, at our next meeting <coughs> Maybe Todd and I will have some conversations. Uh, we'll include Tom in that as, a, as vice chair um, and, and uh, try to formulate what this ad hoc committee is. We'll share that with this, this group. Yep. And I'll write something down too and get it on paper so we have kind of a better vision of what that is and we can go back and forth and Absolutely. get something in place. So the, the board at the next meeting will, will uh, um, have a good understanding of what that ad hoc committee is. And you probably should approve the ad hoc committee too once, I, once we get those names in there. So that's, uh, that's enough for me, unless you guys have other questions about that, that process. Any further questions or comments on this item? Okay, next on the agenda is a discussion of a shared special education director uh, with Northfield. Um, Todd, do you wanna walk us through that? I will, and I'm, I'm going to call Cheryl here pretty soon, so you sit down for now, Cheryl, but I'm sure I'll call you later. Um, we were approached by Northfield to talk about the potential of sharing a, a special education director between both the districts. And so Cheryl and I sat down and we, we tried to figure out what it would look like and we um, envisioned some, some very positive things that, I could, that could happen with the district. There's certainly some uh, pieces that would, we'd have to take a look at to make the adjustment for this to happen. I think the first thing, if you take a look at the, the flow chart that, it, the revised flow chart now, not the one that was on the board book. We handed out a new one, so if you guys need a new one, if you didn't get that, we'll give it to you. But it breaks down what this could look like. The shaded piece is the Faribault portion, current portion, and the white where the non-shaded part is basically where the Northfield section of the director is. Now keep in mind that both school districts have similar enrollment. Okay. So if you look at the, the top part of it, there would be an advisory group that would be the superintendent of Northfield and, and me and the director, uh, especially which would be Cheryl, that would advise the director on different sorts of actions that they would take. It's pretty common in co-ops. The director of special services would have two secretaries, uh, a special services secretary in Faribault, the current one, and then another special services secretary, depending on how Northfield would format that, that's how they would issue that. So she'd have two secretaries for now. And then you see underneath there the different pieces that the director would be in charge of, the school nurses, the assistant director, 
um, which currently is Lindsay. Uh, you probably don't know the names here, but we do have an assistant director, the CREC EBD coordinator. And then the white portions, again, would be over in the Northfield pieces that she would be in charge of. Okay, so far? And then the next, the assistant director then would, would still be in charge of the ECSE coordinators and the case facilitators. We have three case facilitators in Faribault right now. And then um, the case facilitators are in charge of the due process clerical. And I think we have four due process clerical right now that help with some of the paperwork for the special education teachers and staff. All right. So if you look at it, just from a person looking at the structure and the hierarchy of the tree, uh, and keep in mind that we have similar enrollments with Faribault, uh, with uh, Northfield, we do have uh, quite a few more on the Faribault side than what Northfield does. Now Northfield's gonna have to take care of their right side. They'll, they'll have to probably hire an assistant director um, next year and, and do some other pieces that'll fill in. The financial advantage of this is that if uh, the director of special services from Faribault is going to be sharing services with Northfield, then we would set up a contract where they'd be responsible for 50% of their pay and salaries. Okay? So that's the theory behind it right now, and that's where the discussion occurs. occurs. We really started discussing about it, quite honestly, last Thursday, and we've, um, we've visited with the special ed staff, cabinet staff, principals. We're trying to get all the different pieces out there that we think um, are what I would, that could be uh, potential roadblocks. I personally see it as a good situation for us. I think that we certainly have a very good structure in place right now in Faribault, um, but I think we can make it a little bit better by sharing some of the services and, and collaborating with our, our neighbors. And We do a, a lot of collaborating with, with them right now. Okay, So I'm going to leave it open right now, and if you have any questions, I'm probably going to pull Cheryl up with regard to the questions that you may have, so you can address either Cheryl or I with some of these components that we have, okay? My question is that right now you're full-time here. With this, you're only like half-time here. Correct. I mean, can you get your work done? Well, I believe with some of the restructuring and um, some of the work that we're doing now to try to put together the procedures and, and make some things more automatic that I believe that that will be doable. Uh, if you look at other districts that um, do this kind of um, collaboration, uh, there are some districts <coughs> that Bell Plain and Jordan has the same number of special education students, about the same number of um, students overall in their population, and it is doable given the the appropriate infrastructure in both districts. How long of a contract would you have to start with? Or oh, you mean, I think that we'd go, agreement. I think it'd go year to year. year, we'd, year we'd have a contract year. that we'd negotiate and we'd do it for the third, well, it'd be the yeah, 13, 14 school year. Uh, Northfield has the other say, of course, in this whole piece to see how they want to do that agreement but we'd do it year by year. year. Why did they approach us? Well, I think they have the special education director retiring right now, and there's an opportunity for them, as well as us, to maybe share some services and maybe help out with some of the costs. So it's actually kind of a, if we can prevent any sort of, sorry, if we can prevent any sort of um, pressure on the other staff as a result of this, then there could be some sort of um, advantage to having that collaborative effort with another school district. You just, if you have two things working together, you just get a lot more out of it. There could be more resources, there could be uh, better communication. Um, we're, we have a very successful CREC program right now with Northfield, so. What's percentage of special ed students, when you combine it, like, do we have 60% and they have 40 or what? You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, comparing our numbers to their numbers? Yeah. Our numbers are, are fairly close. We have about 100 more special education students than Northfield does at this time. Just a comment, there's, a, there's another piece of the flow chart that would benefit this kind of relationship is that the majority of Northfield and all of us are in Rice County, so you're dealing with, with the services from Rice County. And I know Dakota County comes into Northfield schools, um, but I think it facilitates both districts dealing with 
with one county agency for the most part in dealing with students' needs. I would agree. So that, that's another advantage rather than having one entity work with Rice County and then another entity, you've got one person, yourself and others that are working with the, uh, with the county. And I think there's an advantage to that. I would agree. A um, uh, couple of quick questions, uh, I think quick questions. Uh, Faribault will be the fiscal host for this, is that That's correct? right. Um, which means most of the money will flow through Faribault um, and will get reimbursed by Northfield for, for those expenses. Exactly. Um, also, um, I, don't, I don't know how meaningful this is, so I'm, I'm asking you, um, as I look at the flow chart, um, at the bottom of the flow chart, there's a bit of an asymmetry um, dealing with case facilitators in particular. Um, I'm curious as to what impact you see and how that means the services will be delivered in the two districts. Um, whether or not you see the two districts coming into alignment and how that particular aspect takes place or if they're similar enough as it is to, to stay like that, what are your, your thoughts on that? I really haven't um, begun to think about what that means for, for Northfield. That would really be in the next phase of, of working with them to see, say, what would be the changes that, that need to happen there in order to, to put the infrastructure in place to make this work on both sides. Um, I believe that our structure with our case facilitators really sets us up to be in a good place with this. Um, we have case facilitators that not only do the um, evaluation of our students, but they also do some lead leadership in our due process procedures and keeping staff up to date on, on those procedures, which helps us in the long run when we're coming up for monitoring and, and making sure that we're staying in compliance with all of the laws and rules. You know, one of the things, if you stay around long enough, things come around. Um, and the kind of structure you're talking about here uh, was in place uh, back in 81 and was in place for a number of years where there was one director of special ed for both Northfield and Faribault, plus other districts. Uh, in the what was at that time called the Cannon Valley Special Education Cooperative. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting to see this resurrection again of um, having one director and uh, a director who was responsible back then probably isn't doing the kind of a job that you will do, Cheryl. Um, probably, uh, probably should have been fired a long time ago. Um, but uh, it is interesting to see that you know one of the things that the legislature legislature was very interested in over this last year was shared services as it relates to more efficiency uh, in operation of schools and I think this brings about that potential that possibility of um, having more efficiency um, in, in the district in the two districts so um, I certainly think it's very doable um, I think the one position that's going to have a lot more piled on their desk is a director of special ed because you're going to be working with two separate um, uh, business services. Um, but again, uh, it's not as complex in today as it was in 81. Um, it's more complex now than it was in 81, but I think it's very doable. Well, I'm, I'm confident with, with the structures that we have in place and the supports that we have in place here in Turbo. <coughs> And because I have a history in Northfield and I do know their, their system, I believe that gives us an advantage as well. I think that also speaks very well of the relationship that Todd has created with Northfield schools too in the fact that they're willing to explore shared services. So, and you as well, sure. Thank you. Where do you have concerns? <laughs> well, I think that the, you know the, the main concern especially as I talk to others is is keeping things moving forward I think we're really moving in a very positive direction in the district um, I think there's a lot of good things that have been in place that we've also put in place and and to keep that momentum going and um, I think I think it's um, you know the, the concern is is that maybe you won't get there as quickly as, as people would like to, you know, to that to the point where they want to be with some of the things running a little bit smoother. Uh, however, you know, a director doesn't do this job alone. Um, I have great staff that, I, that work in the district here. I know there's great staff in Northfield as well. 
Um, I believe that um, having some of the, the procedures and going through our monitoring that we went through last year and helping us to, to get to the place where we need to be um, is a little clearer and I think I think we're able to get there doing it this way. Mr. Chair, I have one other question if I can. Um, would you combine the special ed advisory committees or keep them separate? You know, um, I've, I've just thought a little bit about that. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think there's some advantages to that. I, I think um, the systems work. I, now that I know the difference between how Fairbo um, is unique and Northfield is unique, um, sometimes that, that I could see that could be possible, but maybe not right away. I think that's something down the road to look okay. at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Or do you have concerns? Well, my biggest concern is probably the what's the unknown out there right now. We do as much as we can for planning purposes, and we think theoretically that it looks like it works. Um, both Jerry and I have experience with multiple districts with one shared director, so I've seen it work. It's just a matter of, of that unknown piece. I, you know, what I'd like to do, and I, Cheryl and I will probably do this in the next couple weeks, is just go around and, and visit with all special ed staff. Um, I've asked them to email me with a little bit of feedback and try to figure that out. But I think that'll be the best thing is to communicate with the special education staff to make sure that they're comfortable with it. So that's my biggest concern. And uh, who do you report to that? I mean, how do you share the two superintendents? Well, as you see in the, in the flow chart there, um, the two superintendents would create an advisory and then we would meet monthly together to review what's happening in both districts and look at the policies and procedures. And I'd see me making an evaluation one year than the superintendent of Northfield doing an, an evaluation the following year. That's what I'm interested in. Yeah. The contract stays with Fairville Schools, your contract stays yes. with Fairville Schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. They would be purchasing services from us. Yeah. Okay. I think one of the other positive pieces too is that Dr. Lewis would be staying on half time with Northfield Schools over next school year to help transition not only the special education portion of his <coughs> position to me, but also to the other um, positions that will be taken on as other roles that we have. Okay. So that, that relates to my, uh, my last question, which was sort of timeline in general. Um, so when would this position, if, it, if we go forward with it, and we're still in the discussion phase, but if we go forward with it, does it start this summer um, with some transition time next year? Is that right, I would believe July 1. July 1 is the start date, and there'd be some transition time with the Northfield District. <coughs> right, throughout, throughout the year next year. Is this a one-year plan subject to be re renewal next, the following year, or a two-year plan, or how would? I think it's whatever the board wants to approve, mm -hmm. so it's up to you guys to see what they do. When we start talking about contract, we'll have a discussion with, with Clean and, and the others about the contract, how we want to structure it, and we'll bring back uh, the suggestions. It takes Northfield's approval to a board. That's correct. They have to approve it also. Yep. And I assume they're having similar discussions to as we are right now. Yeah, they are. Yep. Same same discussions. Yep. Okay. Any further questions on this item? All right. Thank you, Sean, very much. All right, last other items of information, uh, legislative update, Tom, anything to share with us? I do, and I have a little video for you. Um, Drew, are you ready? Yeah, Th on. This comes from, this is the pizza video, Jerry, if you've seen that yet off of the C website. I have not. All right, so this kind of gives you an idea of some property tax and equity and what we are going to plan on showing to the legislators eventually. So I'll let uh, Drew take it over, it's not very long. On YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> you look like you're from Businessville, is that right? Yes, I'm from Businessville. Alright. That'll be ten dollars. Thank you very much. Wow, that's great. I'll have a pizza with the works too. You live in hometown, don't you? Yes, ma'am. Proud to be from hometown Minnesota. A pizza with the works will cost you $30. Thank you. 
But I only have ten dollars. Oh. Well, for hometown folks, this is what you get for ten dollars. But that's not fair. He paid the same and he got a much better pizza. Well, that's our special formula here at Capital Pizza. <laughs> you wouldn't accept this if a restaurant treated you this way. Yet this unfairness is real for a lot of school children and taxpayers across Minnesota. Here's how it works. When the residents in Businessville pass a levy referendum for their schools, the corporations, shopping malls, and office complexes help pay that bill. Neighboring hometown has very little business development. When residents in hometown pass a school levy for an identical amount of money, they pay two or three times as much. You heard right. That's double or even triple the dollars for the same amount of school levy money. Homeowners in Businessville get a tax discount that is sanctioned and approved by state lawmakers. Under this same unfair system, if levy taxes are equal in the two towns, Businessville schools get two or three times more levy revenue than hometown schools. This allows Businessville schools to offer their students more opportunities and a higher quality education than students in neighboring hometown who have larger class sizes, fewer music and arts programs, outdated technology, <coughs> no extra help for kids who need it, and fewer advanced courses. It's time to end this unfair system of taxation and support equity in education. Tell your legislators to equalize education funding to make Minnesota's system of funding public schools fair. For more information, go to schoolsforequity.org. All public school students, like me, must have equal access to a high quality education, regardless of where they live in Minnesota. I didn't create the video, so but I, it was, it was, yeah, you bet. But it does summarize some of the issues that Schools for Equity and Education is trying to address this legislative session. And in fact, we do have a strategy in place that we're going to start implementing um, at the end of January during the legislative session. The legislative session starts next week, next Tuesday when they begin the session. So they'll start talking about these different Starts pieces. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, I'm sorry. I'm a week off already, so thank you. But um, we'd like to find some community members that would like to email their legislators and um, also come with me to attend some legislative sessions. So not just school board members and not just the staff members, but it'd be nice to get some community members, so if there's, there's community members out there, to come help the equalize the, the tax issue, that would be great. There's also another uh, component that is supported pretty much by all different groups, and that is the work that Colleen Murdestorp and her group did with the education financing piece. And it has a lot of very good pieces within it that um, further equalizes a lot of the different revenue disparity that's out there right now with the school districts. Um, ideally, when you saw the picture with the blue line and the green line, that should be the same for everybody tax impact and revenue should be the same and it's gotten further and further apart as a result of um, legislation over the years. So we're going to be looking for some recruits and lobbying up at the legislature and hopefully we'll be able to recruit not only you but also some community members. So that's our next step. Any questions for Tom on this? Or? I would just say we stack up in that quick compared to and I can give you that link. They actually have it um, individualized for every single school district that, that's a member of C. So what I'll do is I'll send you that link, and then you can look at the equalization of Fairville compared to all the other districts in the state. We are still in the, um, the high tax range when it compares to most of the school districts in the state compared to the revenue that we receive. So we're not very good. We're not. We're, we're better than Northfield, but we're not we're as good. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how do we compare to somebody like Freeborn or Worthington where they don't have, or yep. where they don't have much industry? Yeah, and when I give you that, you'll be able to put in your own data to see which ones you want to compare. They'll have all those different communities out there. So, What are the chances of, to like a work session, Patty Fritz and mm -hmm. Senator, I think, Jensen coming to one of our meetings? 
think that's Because I think possible. Fritz was at a county commissioner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good suggestion. Who else have I forgotten in those that are in our district that represents? Those are our two state reps. Yep. That's, I don't know if you're thinking of a different level of rep, but yeah, those are our state reps. Yep, and that could be, depending probably March, April is when you want to talk to them. That's when it gets pretty hot and heated. And we can, I can check to see what their schedules are to see if we can. Mm -hmm. The reverse of that is if you want to go to the Capitol anytime during those things, we There's can also have. There's a legislative day that the county, city, and school, they used to be separate, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now there's, I was thinking that we could talk to the city mm -hmm. and the county people. We could, you know, all chip in for a bus or a small bus, mm -hmm. one of our buses, and go up there. Yep. I think that's what's, mm -hmm. what it's going to take this What year. date is that? February? It's usually in February. I don't know if it's been set yet, uh, Richard. I think it has. Yeah. Is it? But it's, there was some it, literature, so. but I, it's, okay. it should be on the MSBA <laughs> website. We did. Is that the same date that we went with Fairville Futures? It might be the same date because uh, we went up there with a lot of community members too. Yeah. And met with the, actually, there was a Chamber of Commerce that went up there. So. It, it seems to me that, you know, we've made, as a district, made an effort to inform the community about the financial situation. This is just additional clarification on what the issues that we've been talking about. It, it seemed to me be very appropriate to put a link to this on our school website so that people could uh, uh, access that and take a look at, at, at what we've been trying to say about uh, the needs for school funding. I'm glad you said that. And that's, I, I say that over and over again <clears throat> at our meetings, the, the, the amount of funding that we get compared to other school districts is not only unfair, it's, it's, it's insufficient, it's not adequate for the programs that we want to implement. And that's why I keep on telling people it's not a local issue, it's a state issue and we have to get those state uh, representatives on board with us. How do we overcome the Minneapolis, St. Paul and the suburbs, Rochester and Duluth, which population that's where mm -hmm. the people are? I mean, that's, I mean, how do we overcome that fair or yeah, you or, right. you know, how, how do we, where all the votes are basically there and they're not going to let the money out. I think for the, and you, Colleen can help even address some of the situation, the, the working group that came up with the, with the um, formula for the thing was a pretty good cross section of people throughout the state, weren't they? And pretty much supportive out of, I think, one person in that group or, so I, overall, I think it was a pretty good cross section. Now, there was some common ground in there. The hard part is when you start getting different organizations, including C, trying to pick apart different pieces that really should be part of the whole pie where everybody agrees on it. So you try to find some common grounds, and that's what all these lobbying, the uh, MSBA, MASA, C, and all the other organizations out there. Edu Education Minnesota is another one that's out there that's lobbying. So you try to find some common ground. Any other questions for Todd on this? I'd like to make uh, a statement. <clears throat> I think um, I understood what you said in terms of the, the programs that we want to implement, but I think the programs that we are losing, the programs that we'd like to support, are not some excess thing. We're trying, we're struggling to maintain a basic level of comprehensive education pre through K or pre through 12 yep. and so what we're trying to support is not some you know uh, super rich super suburb kind of thing just a basic comprehensive education that puts our students on an equal <coughs> with students across the state and so it's 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 not something local pie in the sky sort of dreamer thing. It's it's basic education that is being underfunded and has been underfunded for many years. Yep, correct. And I'd like to bring up. I think we get about five thousand a student, approximately fifty two hundred. Fifty two seventy four. Yep. But then I've heard Minneapolis gets twelve and a half thousand per pupil unit. Well, it's different. Oh, go ahead. This is where I stop and she picks oh. it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't even know if I can answer it intelligently without information, but the formula allowance per pupil unit is 52.24. That's the same for everybody. 
Now that gets weighted depending on what age the student is, what grade they're in. <clears throat> then you add in other revenue like compensatory, special education, uh, limited English proficiency, basic skills. I mean, there's all kinds of different pots of revenue that affect that number that some districts get and some districts don't. So it's, it's not as easy as saying we get 5,000, they get 12,500. That's not so easy to say that. Our revenue is probably closer to 10 compared to their 12.5. But I'm shooting from the hip, so don't quote me okay. on that. And then you add any levies that they have that we don't have. Right. Which is going to generate additional right. revenue. Or and that's the disparity is right. in how districts are able, some districts are able to pass referendums and other districts are not. That's the huge <coughs> disparity that you saw. In addition to the taxing disparity, there's a disparity in districts that can pass referendums and districts that cannot. Now, St. Paul just passed a $30 million technology levy. Uh, this past November, um, I don't know what the outcome, or what the differential was on the yes and no, but that, that $30 million per year over the next several years, I'm sure the tax impact is not as significant as it would be for us for the levy we were asking for. So that's some of the you know, disparity that works in their two districts. Well, I know that, you know, I do a lot of inspections in Minneapolis St. Paul. I know for the same size house, their taxes are double. And you can check all this. It, it's double for the same house. It's, it's double. Yeah, what do they get for it? Right, but you have to remember that's made up of city and county right, school exactly. district and special exactly. taxing jurisdictions. I mean, yeah. they probably have way more special jurisdictions the dome, than we do. The stadium. Right. The stadium. <laughs> yeah. Light rail. Yeah. All right, thanks, Cliff. All right. Any further questions on this item? Hearing none, we'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all. For I, I, just one question. Um, it's my understanding that the Commissioner of Education is going to be at the middle school on Friday. She Can is. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, Todd? I think the public needs to be aware of that. Yeah, she, and I, I have to check my time first. Let me check real quick. I think it's 10 o'clock. I think it is too. Um, I get it at 1045. Is that what you had it at? I, yeah, Brenda Casillas will be talking at the eighth grade forum from 1045 to 1145 a.m. And uh, that's an honor to have the Commissioner of Education coming down here and speaking to our kids. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you all.